we are going to talk about a number of things, uh, one, of, one of which is uh, how we're going to storm the FDA's citadel when it comes to broad spectrum anti-aging drugs. Um, for the people here who perhaps are not so familiar with one of the issues that has become quite a subject of discussion in the sort of whole longevity field, is this question of how on earth could you get the FDA to approve an anti-aging drug? Because aging isn't a disease. And the FDA's job is to approve uh, treatments for diseases and symptoms. So, panel, can you, thinking, I'm going to start with you, Luciano, and then go to Margaret. I'd, I'd like you both to talk about this problem, how it is being perceived at the moment, and just expand a bit to so give the audience some context. Sure. The mic is on. Yes, please. Um, well, so the FDA... Uh, reviews, assesses, approves products that are based on their relative uh, safety and efficacy profile for specific indications. And indications, conditions that are based on, on science. So it could be to treat migraines or infections or, or um, cancers. And the challenging with aging is that it's a condition that we I have not yet precisely defined, and I think we're getting closer to understanding uh, you know, what aging really means at the scientific level, but until recently, it was just a matter of fact that everybody would go through aging, that aging begins at birth. Uh, but we still have such incomplete understanding, it makes it very difficult today to approve a product that is anti-aging. And so I'll tell you a secret is that, you know, the FDA is, has amazing scientific staff, but they don't have, they don't know any more than the scientists <laughs> that are outside its walls. So if there are questions on the outside about how to define aging, how to evaluate aging, how to measure aging, you know, we have those same questions. We don't have like a trove of secrets that are ready that we can just <laughs> then make it up and regulate based on our internal knowledge. And that's what regulatory science really comes in and something that I know is you know, very dear to, to Peggy in her tenure as FDA commissioner is the development of the, the, the science that really enables nimble, effective regulation of products. Um, so I can't really overstate how important it is to be able to continue to develop this foundational knowledge, scientific knowledge, to support regulation. It's much simpler. Products get developed much faster uh, when we have a very thorough understanding of uh, these types of issues. And then lastly, I just want to, you know, there's a lot of talk today about uh, FDA as a barrier, a little bit of, and I have to say that, you know, exercise, like Brian Kennedy mentioned, is uh, incredible because not only it's highly effective, but you can introduce it into inter interstate commerce without FDA approval. And you can market that without FDA approval, so let's not lose sight of that. Margaret, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I was just going to add that, you know, I know that there are many people in this audience and thinking about these issues that are, you know, sort of struggling with where does FDA fit. And I wanted to, you know, underscore the notion that, you know, FDA, you know, really when it's operating well and in partnership with stakeholders, importantly including the scientific community, really um, can and should be a partner toward advancing the science and the innovation and that the model that we have found in recent years, you know, really works very well is to engage early and in a continuing way to try to identify what are the critical issues and how best to shape the science. And aging is a particularly challenging area for all the reasons that, that Lou was mentioning. I think it's also important to recognize that aging as a broad concept is, is very, very important, but also aging individuals are experiencing a set of diseases where the burden of disease becomes more pronounced over time, and certain diseases which really are phenomenon, phenomena of an aging population, and FDA has obviously a very important role in looking at diseases for those um, looking at, at drugs and medical devices for those specific diseases and indications. And I often, when I was FDA commissioner, was criticized that why is FDA preventing all of these advances in Alzheimer's disease from becoming 
available to patients. You know, what is it about FDA's, you know, bureaucratic process that is, you know, preventing these drugs from being available? Well, you know, it's not FDA barriers. It's where is the science and needing to advance our understanding of the underlying mechanisms of disease and being able, as was mentioned earlier, to identify critical biomarkers and endpoints to speed our understanding and, and to do the science, to work with the scientific community <clears throat> to create new models for understanding clinical trial designs that are more flexible and nimble, for being able to really um, mine data that already exists for, for better answers and to be able to look for subpopulations of responders in certain instances, et cetera. So what I really wanted to underscore was the importance of really viewing FDA not as a barrier but as a partner that ultimately can lead to better, safer, more effective products and level the playing field for industry in terms of standards and expectations. Thank you, Margaret. What I'd like to do is come to Nir Barzilai because uh, you have kind of a very interesting and compelling story uh, about something that you're doing, an experiment that you're running uh, on metformin. And you, as I understand it, would like to try and get it approved as a broad spectrum anti aging drug. Can you just tell me a little bit more how you're trying to approach that and what feedback you're getting from the FDA? Yeah, sure, but just for completion, a, a real cute anecdote, because when we went to the FDA and they asked us, you know, what's aging, I said, I'll, I can give you an abstract and then give you the whole story. I said, start with the abstract. I said, it's the couple that lives somewhere in the United States, elderly couple, and the woman turns to the man and says, honey, why don't we go upstairs and make love? And the husband looks at her and says, sweetie, I cannot do both, okay? That's what we need to fix. So... Um, so you heard this morning that aging is the major risk for all the diseases, that there's a biology for aging, and that this, this can be targeted. Um, so that's the background. And we, a bunch of scientists, said, how can we use this information in order to pave the road for better and better treatment for, um, to target aging? And for reasons that I'll say very briefly, we focused on this drug that is very, it's called metformin. It's very, it's generic, it's cheap, it's safe, it's been 60 years out of the market, and many people are using it. There are billion years use of this drug. And this drug is for diabetes, but it has side effects. One side effect is that it can prevent diabetes if you don't have diabetes. Another side effect that if you're diabetic, it will prevent cardiovascular disease. Another side effect that if you're diabetic, you'll have much less cancer when you take the drug. If you're non-diabetic, you won't develop cognitive dysfunction. If you take this drug when you're diabetic, you live longer, you have less mortality than if you're not diabetic. All those terrible side effects. And we decided, you know, that's a tool. We're a bunch of scientists, we're bringing you a tool. You want to know about metformin? Go to the FDA site. And we want to use this tool in order to change the regulation. Shall I go on and say? Yep. OK. So how do you change the regulation? The FDA and us, like you said, the FDA and us didn't want to have aging as a disease. First of all, not everybody that age has a disease. And there's ageism. And we both didn't want that. And so the question was, what is, you know, what are you going to do that will actually change, will actually depict aging without saying aging is a disease. And we thought about a study where we are going to look at all those diseases that are associated with, with aging, a composite of those diseases. In other words, we'll give metformin and we'll prevent any one of diseases. It doesn't matter, we are agnostic because the risk for those diseases is, is aging. So we'll target aging and will prevent any one of a composite of diseases. And this will become an indication. In other words, a preventing a composite of age-related disease. So the question I think the EFDA has for you, or at least the sort of philosophical question is, you know, how many uh, age-related diseases would you have to show an effect on before you could prove your point? 
Right. So the answer is the answer is more than one. I, I have to I have to explain. We are not going to show a statistical significant change in any one disease. Okay, every disease gets one point. If you had cancer, now you're getting Alzheimer, you get a point. If you had cardiovascular disease, now get diabetes, you get a point. We actually are very worried that we'll have statistically significant in one disease and they'll stop us and say, metformin should now prevent cancer. We don't allow the <laughs> study to go and then we cannot get to the aging part, right? So, so we have to show It would be trends. a great thing, though. Fun? It would be a great thing. <laughs> not for him. Well, no, not for <laughs> us. Listen, not for us. You know, Craig Venter, if to, you know, he opened it up, but Craig Venter says, you know, genetics is everything. And he had the genetics for 70 years, and only then he got the disease, right? If we can, if we can make his 70 years, if he, if he spends 70 years to become biologically 50, which is what we do in animals, then he wouldn't have the cancer, right? So, uh, so, uh, so I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move the curve so that we can prevent. And the point is that it's metformin will be effective. I think we'll succeed because we have all this preliminary data, but it's making the pharmaceutical jump in and developing better and better drugs. You heard about the rapamycin. It's not really ready for chronic use. Just get in and develop drugs. You, you have to understand what, what Laura Demi said before, that she's supporting companies that are developing for diabetes. And by the way, Calico is also not developing aging. Right. And there's pharmaceutical, uh, bio, biotech Cobar here that have an aging thing, but they're developing against obesity and Novartis is doing something with a, a rapamycin, but for immunology, we have to change that, and and then we'll get healthier and healthier. Right. So basically, your contention is is that once you've kind of stormed the FDA citadel and you've gotten something approved, that essentially it will sort of untap this sort of uh, wealth of investment in specifically broad spectrum anti-aging drugs. Well, that's actually very interesting. Um, what I'd like to do um, is circle around a few other little issues as well. Um, one of the things uh, that's coming up, well, one of the questions that often comes up uh, when you're talking about the FDA and regulation is how can we make it easier to approve things? How can we make it cheaper? Yada, 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 yada. And um, I think very few people really realize actually how much change there has been at the FDA um, with regards to those sorts of things recently. Um, what we have seen is we've got this 21st Century Cures Act um, in Congress, and my understanding is that it has quite a good chance of getting passed. I think uh, it did. Oh, really? Oh, oh my God, I've just, I'm just i out of the loop. Okay, great. Well, okay, so it's passed. Um, and I have a piece in print saying it has a good chance of being passed, and it's, uh, I still have time to get that changed tomorrow morning. So. It's almost morning. No, 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 it's, it's, it's uh, 1.38 in the morning. I've got a few hours. Um, <laughs> so the, my question being, uh, what, um, how is this going to change what the FDA does? I know there's extra money, so you'll be able to hire more staff. Um, but there's also some uh, stem cell related uh, work. I mean, how, how, how is this legislation going to impact on what you're doing at the moment in reference to longevity? So, you know, to be able to answer that, let me just take a step back into, I, I see this issue of longevity as being very holistic. And um, as Peggy was mentioning, you know, there are diseases of, associated with the elderly that have gone, I think there's unmet needs, and Alzheimer's, of course, is the, the biggest one and the biggest problem we have because we don't really have effective therapies, and expedition trial just failed, GSK pulled away. So even based on positive preliminary data, uh, when subjected to more rigorous studies, it didn't show to be to have the effect that people had hoped for even based on you know, great mechanisms of actions and, and all this. So, so that's, I can't convey, I think, the importance of maintaining standards for approval because at the end of the day, 
patients need drugs that are safe and effective. And we usually associate an FDA approval with drugs that are safe and effective because historically, that's what it meant. And if there's a tendency towards low approval standards, it becomes less meaningful to have an FDA approval that in a way that doesn't really, at the end of the day, benefit patients and um, their families. Margaret, is that something, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is that something that concerns you, uh, the potential to lower standards at all? Well, I think the standards really matter, and the standards, I think, have contributed, actually, to the vibrancy of um, industry in this country and have certainly contributed to the ability to develop and make available drugs and devices that really benefit patients. You know, I always struggled when I was FDA commissioner about um, saying what is the law about, you know, the FDA standard is safe and effective because there are very few drugs that are actually either fully effective or totally safe. But it is, does the, the, do the benefits and the risks provide, you know, overall the right risk-benefit balance for patients, and certainly for certain drugs, the FDA accepts a much higher level of risk um, than for other indications because, you know, of questions of how serious is the disease, are there other treatments that are available, and increasingly also, what level of risk are patients willing to, to take on, and all of that, you know, can result in complicated equations. But at the end of the day, it really matters, do these products work? Do they do what they claim to yeah. do? And I think that is even more important today than it's been before because of the concerns about costs in this country. And, you know, I see, you know, sort of this, this odd phenomenon now of more and more pressure for FDA to move drugs into the marketplace after initial safety um, studies are done and sort of allow the marketplace to decide. This is a theoretical um, proposal, but you know we hear it all the time. Let the marketplace decide. Let consumers decide you know, if they want to try the drugs and if they work. At the same time, we're talking about an increasingly having a healthcare system that's value Based. Um, based. And how do you assess value? Do you want an, a scientifically based public health agency to be reviewing the data and, and working with the scientific community and stakeholders to assess relative safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of these products? Or do you want insurance companies? And so I, I really do think that um, you know, we need to not be too blasé about abandoning the standards of the FDA because they have proven value. Um, they actually, I think, have led to the development of, of better, more effective products because FDA scientists bring something to the table. Um, and I think in the world we live in, at the end of the day, number one, patients and their loved ones are really depending on the FDA. It's easy to say, get out of the way, let us have access to drugs, and then as soon as there's the problem, people say, how could you do this to us? Um, but I think we need to, to really recognize that we need to together advance the science, and that's where the greatest challenge lies. And you know, you brought up a really important point that I um, about the, the standard, and that it is again go, goes back to like how we uh, assumptions or definitions. Where you know, I was not referring to like a, a super safe and super effective, like you know, because clearly it has to be based on the disease and condition. But what I my my concern about uh, the standards have to do with are we making decisions based on well designed, well thought through trials, for example, that are fit for purpose. Of course, there's not one trial that fits all the needs, but are, you know, is the data being subjected to rigorous evaluation in that manner? Even if we uh, approve something that is, you know, accept greater, greater, greater risk and all, but do we have some co confidence in that data? And that's what I worry about when I refer to lowering standards, because there is a move, a push towards uh, moving things into the marketplace before this, uh, the, the acquisition of this important data. And uh, especially with um, relying on uh, intermediate endpoints, 
And if one is going to do that, it's very important to be able to have then the confirmatory trials that can really tell us whether the product you, really works. You know, you know I, I mean, you're very conservative because you came from the FDA and you believe in it. Uh, I heard... No, the, actually, I'm I, sorry. I have to defend myself now because I went to the FDA to shake things up at the FDA. And you came converted. No, not at all. I continued to shake things up. Tr believe me, I continued to shake... Oh, okay. But, but I, I, didn't yeah. mean to, uh, I didn't mean to... But uh, I don't think there's anything... No, no, it's no, okay. No, I, I, I want to give an offense. example. Okay, just one of you talk at a time. Yeah. Let her finish her point, then you near, okay? And then just oh, be, be quick, Lucian. Okay, Dana, but I just want to hear what she wants to say. Uh, no, no. I just wanted to say that it's not a conservative. It's a, I don't Fine. Okay. Now you the, go. The Japanese FDA that was considered more conservative than anyone, but what they have is they have a crisis, and they have lots of uh, elderly people, and they have more, uh, you know, more sick people. And I heard the FDA when he, uh, the Japanese FDA director, when he announced it, I heard the translation, and there are certain there are certain diseases that they're giving. Um, after a phase two, uh, extensive phase two trial, so they have the safety, they're going to let the pharmaceutical, like you said, they let the pharmaceutical sell the drug. And, and they calculated not only it will be available more readily, but it's going to mean that the pharmaceuticals are going to have an income, and in five years, they're going to follow and give them the report. It, it was clear, it was clear at the end that this can work in Japan because in Japan they will report the truth. Okay, well, and yeah, I have, I have a couple of questions there because, I mean, that sounds fabulous, but there's all kinds of problems with that approach. And um, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, if the drug doesn't work, you're going to take it off market. That's something in the US we have seen doesn't tend to happen. And the other question I have is like, who's paying for these drugs? I mean, when the FDA quite controversially uh, approved uh, the drug for Duchenne's, don't worry, I won't ask you about that because I know it caused quite a fuss. Um, but I mean, one of the, uh, you know, outcomes is that um, it's going to get covered, presumably, you know, if you, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the, the, you know it's, it's for children, and so there'll be government support for that. So, you know, immediately that company gets capitalized. Now, if that drug produces a sort of 1% increase in the amount of uh, this particular molecule that's needed for, for benefit, and there's, there's this severe doubt as to whether which it's going to be efficacious. And so effectively, um, what's happening now is that, um, you know, the, the government, you, the taxpayers are capitalizing the drug. The insurers have backed away from it largely. Um, you know, they've capitalized the company. The company's running its phase three trial on your tax dollar. And even if it proves, turns out not to work, history shows us that it's very difficult to get that drug withdrawn. And, you know, it's an emotive issue. People want drugs. Even if they don't work, they want the hope of a drug. So I, I guess that's a long way of asking, you know, OK, it's worked in Japan. What on earth makes you think that in the largest drug market in the world where, you know, every company knows how to game the system, you're not going to get a really tragically bad outcome. Well, and, and actually, I think the Japanese model is not as um, exactly described either. I mean, I think that it's, they, in, in a couple of domains, are looking at this approach. They're, they've been talking a lot with the US FDA and modeling after the accelerated approval pathway at the FDA, et cetera. Um, and increasingly, there is, you know, a, a much more blurring of the lines. You know, the classic sort of phase one, phase two, phase three is really not the model that's always used anymore when the science is strong. And, you know, right. I, I was surprised when I was FDA commissioner, I'd sometimes be on a panel like this and someone would say to me, well, you know, the FDA will not approve a drug unless there are two randomized controlled clinical studies. And I said, well, that's actually not true. And they said, oh, no, it is. And I would say, well, you know, actually, you know, what about this drug? What about that drug? You know, you look at the recent drug approvals, and, you know, it's very striking. The, I think the majority, you correct me because I'm a little bit far away from some of the data now, but the majority are approved with some kind of a surrogate marker or biomarker. Um, many are approved with um, very small studies, um, often studies 
that don't have the traditional control arms. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of flexibility and there needs to be more, but it needs to be grounded in good science because at the end of the day, it doesn't benefit patients and it doesn't benefit companies if the drugs don't work. And in the near term, you can be fooled, but over time, you know, either they benefit the patients or they don't, either they're safe or they're not. And, you know, I think truth will will out. So I think you know that it's much more effective and beneficial to everyone to really try to build the science base and create the regulatory frameworks that reflect strong, robust science. I'm sorry, we're all beating you up, Nir. Um, did you want to come back? So well, usually it's the FDA I that gets beaten up. I thought I made them up. defensive. I didn't think they were. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I thought we came no, out no, punching. I, 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 totally, <clears throat> I totally agree. I just wanted to say there are other uh, models. Okay. No, that's fine. Now, I just want to warn the audience that um, in a minute or so, I'm going to be asking for questions. Please do send them through on the app if you're shy. Um, but do, I, have, uh, I have one more question. But did anyone else want to kind of say anything before I ask my next question? You know, again, under, in, emphasizing the importance of understanding the scientific questions and the disease processes is really what Peggy's saying. Like, you know, it's really critical to have a strong scientific foundation for a disease that has a very predictable um, course for which a treatment effect of the investigation of products is expected to be dramatic. You know, one can do very small studies uh, and, and, again, fit for purpose. And for other diseases and conditions and for the therapeutics, you really have to be very careful because it's very difficult, for example, to identify excess mortality associated with a product when the course of the disease is variable. When, so it, there's no one solution and one trial for all the different conditions. And we have to just work together and develop a science base and have a very interactive dialogue with the FDA to be able to find the most nimble path forward for products and, and you know, how to establish whether they work or not. Well, I will give a, a word of support for the FDA because I have to say, uh, when I was writing a piece on longevity, I contacted them to sort of ask them about uh, their sort of regulatory stance towards anti-aging drugs. And normally when you approach these agencies with any kind of question, any kind of government agency, you'll be surprised if you get more than a sentence back. And I got uh, I got three paragraphs from them, which uh, sort of is verbal diarrhea in the world that I work for. And I, I was amazed at the extent to which they were willing to talk about the issues uh, that were involved. So I think we can count the FDA as certainly very engaged in uh, longevity. Before I go to human trials, there's one question I wanted to ask, actually. Um, the National Academies, I mean, it was striking. When I was hearing Nir talk about his trial, I kind of wondered whether there should be more trials like this. I mean, more kind of, you know, very kind of uh, sort of broad spectrum anti aging trials like this on different things. Is that something the National Academy has ever thought about? Have you ever thought about maybe more focus on aging itself? I don't know if that's something. You're asking me? Yeah, the National as, Academies, um, yeah. Well, the National Academy of Medicine is, is, is not a direct research organization. It's an organization that is actually intended um, to provide um, science-based policy advice right. to government and other entities, um, pulling together the best and the brightest, wherever they may be, to, to look at, at important questions of concern, but they don't generate um, research data themselves. Um, you know, obviously our research funding in this country is a combination of government-sponsored research with NIH playing a critical role right. in this arena, but other entities like National Science Foundation as well, and then um, private sector funded research and, um, and philanthropic uh, funding for research as well. But do you have a role to play in this whole area? I mean, I the guess National in, 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 in aging. In National Academy of Sciences. It's the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine now is what we call it. Um, a role to play in terms of, of pointing to how, what are the critical needs in research, pointing to um, how to better understand existing data and strategies for future data. I mean, certainly when I was at the FDA and when I was in government and other roles as well, I would turn to um, the academies for help. One of the areas was in helping us think about um, new models to develop the regulatory science needed to really be that bridge from investments in, in discovery science and then 
translational science of bringing um, the research into human populations, but really, you know, what's needed to really define right. whether this product is suitable for marketing. Do you know, I'm just gonna stop you there because I, I can see the time's running out. Can I see some hands for some questions? Great, I'll have those two gentlemen there and then the guy in the blue shirt. Sorry, I'm really sorry, oh, I no. just noticed the time. I wanna. My question is about long-term side effects and how you can test for those. Um, I know a lot of people who have had, who are on <laughs> drugs for, that are essentially gonna be, uh, they're gonna be on drugs for the rest of their lives for psychiatric issues. And my sense is that these drugs, after a certain point in time, just stop helping these people and end up having very severe uh, deleterious effects. And my sense is that it's really hard to, uh, construct long-term studies for these drugs. So, um, Good question. This is not like a criticism or anything, but I, Natasha, okay. I know you, po you pointed out it's like really hard to pull drugs off of the, off yep. of the market, and especially when people are chronically on them. So, Okay, good no, question. Good. Question, anyone? Mine, mine is actually a really similar question. Go ahead, Good. go on. Okay, because yeah, I was actually gonna expound on the same point, that the FDA and like medicine in general were really good at treating chronic disease, and we're really good at uh, regulating drugs for the diseases of aging, but we haven't done a lot in the regulation of prevention, uh, which is kind of what we're talking about with metformin That's right, and so yeah. on. So metformin is an incredibly safe drug, right? We've been using it for 40 years. We really know a lot about its safety profile. So my question related to this was, what is the bar going to be from a timing perspective to establish something as safe enough to be used in prevention from the FDA's perspective. Great. Uh, FDA then, yeah. Yeah, so it really is. So there are different questions. Different qu so I think it's a really important uh, issue you raise about how do you monitor uh, you know, years after somebody's on. And I, we, 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 don't, we don't do a very good job as a society in doing that. And I think that today there's an editorial in the England Journal of Medicine article about, you know, use of real world evidence. Our commissioner is a senior author. And um, it's, it, I think that can help a little bit in understanding the long-term impact of these drugs, relying on medical records, et cetera. But it's very impossible to expect, you know, that you're gonna be now responsible for submitting this data for, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Uh, in that line also, this is, you know, we don't have enough elderly participation in clinical trials. The inclusion of elderly patients in clinical trials is um, small, and they're the ones that are gonna be receiving this drug, so you have to do a better job in enrolling elderly patients. Uh, in clinical trials because they'll be receiving those drugs. Uh, your question was, um, remind me again, I have an Alzheimer's moment. <laughs> so, I was what the standards are? The standard. So, you know, it's, it's again, uh, there's a, a study planned or started already on um, preventing Alzheimer's, so it's gonna be before patients actually have. I think it really depends, a little bit like with the vaccine paradigm, you know, it's, it's, it's we wanna have a higher safety standard if you're gonna give something to a healthy person, but today with more predictive, methods, patients are at risk, the risk benefit changes a bit. So I think again, science and technology is gonna help us get to the right balance. Nir, did you wanna say something? J just that our population for TAME, TAME is targeting aging with metformin, uh, is 65 to 80. So that's all the population we're doing. Anything you want to add, Margaret? Well, just you know, one comment on you know, metformin in particular, which is you know, really not your typical situation because it is an old drug that we know a lot about in terms of safety, but, but we really should be as sophisticated as we can be about tapping into existing databases to inform. I mean, you mentioned in some areas, you know, there are, there's an ability to, to have important new insights into populations that have been using metformin and comparing them to other similar populations that haven't been using it, and, and, and that's helping us to understand. We're not gonna have one trial that answers all the important questions. Um, we're gonna have to be creative about collecting information that already exists and analyzing it, and having real world evidence and observational data, um, and, and mining existing data, and then also elaborating that with, with new studies that you know, drill down more deeply in certain key areas, et cetera, and that's the way we have to think about it. Gentleman back there, do you have a microphone? No. Um, gentleman over there needs a microphone. I can try to speak loud. Uh, Paul Spector, I'm a physician, and uh, I just wanted to talk about something that seems behind a lot of the issues that are coming Is there a question? Yes. Great. 
What do you think about the business of making something a medical problem, the medicalization of aging, and then what, what are the, the knock-on effect in terms of a culture where you're promoting in all sorts of ways behaviors that are creating things that you're calling diseases and that you're creating drugs to treat? Um, it seems paradoxical that the focus, uh, and I understand these are very important things, and you have sick people and they have to be taken care of, but there does have to be some focus on how did they become sick, and is it a disease or is it a behavioral problem? And uh, where's the well, Okay, to share it, it's a good question, from? but this is, this is a question about policy and regulation of interventions, right? So right. we're not talking about prevention exactly. Well, you're talking about metformin. Right, okay. Well, well he's that's talking about metformin. I think, you know, from a policy perspective, we heard some of the things that, that we know really make a difference that are not medicalizing, but they're saying you start early in life to develop healthy behaviors, and that actually is as good as anything we know right. in terms of prolonging life and quality life. Oh, all right, do you want to answer that question, Nir, about um, medicalization of aging? No, you know, it's always curious to me. I mean, do you want to be healthy as you, you age? You know, it's not only you wanted to be healthy when you age, but the, the, even if we modestly increase health span, we're talking about health span here, this is a $7 trillion saving by the year 2050. It's good for the individuals, it's good for the economy. I don't, I don't understand, what are your options? You want to continue and get sick and get diseases after the other, and three no. treatments for every disease? Of course not, but one of the things that the FDA does, and I think is very reasonable, is it looks at safety, efficacy, and what alternatives are available. And we have alternatives right now that cost nothing, or that cost very little compared to a medication. So I'm not against metformin, I'm all for it, but I'm saying, there's something missing in the conversation if we're not talking about ways in which we could prevent what metformin's treating. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna stop you there because I think we've been talking about that all day and in fact, uh, I, I banned any further conversation about kale and, and green juice and exercise, but um, <clears throat> there's some vegetables out in the uh, hallway so you can help yourself to those. Um, it, it's a good point, but that's not what we're here to discuss. Um, we've had a great session and I'd like you all to put your hands together and thank our uh, speakers, our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.